Hello. Welcome, kind viewers and listeners. I need to flag a spot in the very last few seconds of my response to Professor Veldman's talk, where I say near possibility when I meant to say near impossibility. It flips what I'm saying there 180 degrees, so I wanted to alert you to watch for this at the end of my talk. Um, Bernie, can you hear me? I can. Perfect. We can hear you as well. So um, I'm also very pleased to welcome this evening our respondent, Dr. Bernie Zalea, um, who is also a former A grad of the UF Religion and Nature program here, who then went on to get his PhD in sociology at UC Santa Cruz, where he now serves as an adjunct faculty member. Um, Bernie has also served two terms on the National Board of Directors of the Sierra Club, and we are very pleased to welcome him to respond to Robin's talk, and then we will open the floor to questions after Bernie is finished with his response. So Bernie, take it away. Good evening. Good evening, all. It is good to be back here at the University of Florida, if only virtually. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond to Professor Veldman's excellent presentation. There are a great many things I could say about Professor Veldman's talk, but alas, I have only a few minutes, so I'll have to share only what I think are the biggest takeaways and the most important paths for research. The non-evangelical non world woke up the morning of November 9, 2016, to learn what for most was a stunning fact, namely that based on exit polling, 81% of white American evangelicals had voted for Donald Trump. This was contrary to what the rest of America thought they knew about evangelicals, white or otherwise. I, however, was not surprised having just spent the preceding six months doing an intensive amount of my doctoral field research among the Calvary Chapel variety of American evangelicalism. By election day, I was duly prepped for what turned out to be a surge in white evangelical support for a Republican candidate for president, the highest level ever attained by any Republican candidate in the last half century. And that pattern was repeated in uh, the 2020 election. As we near the seven year anniversary of that infamous June 15, 2015 escalator ride, which inaugurated the Trumpist turn in American politics, it is time to travel back in time to the presidential election of 1976, when American evangelicals helped elect the most progressive president of the last half century, Jimmy Carter. Many people today are surprised to learn that back then, American evangelicals were mostly pro-choice, pro-reproductive freedom. Indeed, I was surprised when I learned this. Back then, in, the, in 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention was passing resolutions calling for liberalized abortion laws. And when the Roe versus Wade decision was announced, W.A. Criswell, a former president of the SBC issued a press release praising the decision back then forced birth, anti-reproductive freedom. Um, I'm hearing strange noises. Are things coming through okay? I'll keep going. You're good. Okay. Um, uh, and when the Roe versus Wade decision was announced, W.A. Criswell, a former president of the SBC, issued a press release praising the decision. Back then, forced birth, anti-reproductive freedom ideology was primarily a Catholic position. How and why did this change? How did this flip by the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan? In a word, race. White Southern evangelicals became incensed by federal interference in the racist segregationist policies of evangelical colleges. The IRS was enforcing the ban on radic 
racial discrimination in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by denying the tax exemption to the evangelical Bob Jones University in South Carolina. To fight back, anti-abortion ideology quite suddenly became the proxy issue because an open and explicit embrace of racist college policies was politically untenable. Due to time constraints, I can only flag this fascinating history and simply refer you to religious historian Randall Balmer's excellent 2021 book, Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right, where he narrates this history in detail. Professor Veldman mentions the Fairness Doctrine. Staying back in the 1980s for a moment, I want to say a bit more. The Fairness Doctrine was a regulation issued by the Federal Communications Commission in 1949 that required the holders of broadcast licenses both to present controversial issues of public importance and to do so in a manner that fairly reflected differing viewpoints. The Reagan era FCC abolished that requirement in 1987. Had the Fairness Doctrine not been eliminated, Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck, as we know them, could not have presented their ideological tirades in their respective venues without counterbalancing viewpoints. The age of the ideological silo had arrived, allowing right-wing talk radio, Fox News, and now Newsmax and One America News Network to deliver their content unopposed. It would be interesting to discover who, in Fox News, the Limbaugh and Beck production teams, and other right-wing outlets who first recognized that the right-wing broadcasting ecosystem unleashed by the abolition of the Fairness Doctrine could be used to create a new form of American Christianity, one that internalized and then vigorously proclaimed the atheistic Ayn Randian form of libertarian, anti-government, anti-environment ideology. But someone did, perhaps Limbaugh himself. What Professor Veldman so expertly has done is to detail for us what that new ideology looked like once it emerged, the rhetorical devices utilized to deploy it, and her utilization of Robert Bella's model of civil religion is very helpful. As Bella recognized, the civil religion he was describing had to be ecumenical in its appeal uh, to the generically religious and had to be boiled down to just a few elements in order to work. Professor Veldman shows us that the same process works when applied to the new form of mostly Christian anti-environmental civil religion. What has yet to be fully investigated is why this new form of Christianized anti-environmental ideology is so readily taken up within the white evangelical setting. I have laid out part of what I think is going on in two recent presentations I have delivered over the last six months, one to the California Sociological Association and one to the American Society for Environmental History. In the first, I show how evangelicals' intense apocalypticism leads to their vigorous denial that even that environmental issues can ever be important. They are not merely indifferent. They are adamantly hostile to environmental concern, including climate change, because it can only serve as a tragic, even satanic, distraction from bringing souls to Jesus before the imminent rapture. Their apocalypticism does not lead them to quit their jobs and sit around idle. No, their apocalypticism instead serves as a handy escape from having any environmental responsibility at all, except they shouldn't litter, but that's it. My second presentation, in my second presentation, I lay out how collective narcissism has taken hold within evangelical churches 
and how their beliefs in eternal torture in hell and eternal bliss in paradise help facilitate this collective narcissism. I can't repeat, repeat these presentations here. Instead, I hope you will Google Bernard Zalea YouTube to find your way to my YouTube channel where both presentations are posted. On the matter of evangelical collective narcissism, Professor Veldman's talk helps us understand how that psychological dynamic was created and spread. To quote Thoreau, way out of context, the key has been to simplify, simplify. Boiling Christianity down to a new and much simpler creed has been key to spreading this new civil religion. One of my key research subjects has been the politically powerful right-wing evangelical megachurch pastor in Southern California, Jack Hibbs, who I interviewed in 2017. He started his church in his living room in 1990. Eventually, he, he, came, and he eventually came to reduce evangelical Christianity's core requirements to what he still calls the trinity of truth. Number one, despise and persecute LGBTQ community, utilizing the power of the state to enact this persecution as is currently happening in Florida. Number two, sacralize human fetuses in order to deny reproductive freedom and use the power of law to force women to give birth. Number three, sacralize Israel and shield it from all critique. Interestingly, number one and number two have no biblical sanction. Indeed, the Book of Norm Numbers has a bizarre abortion ritual. A few verses can arguably be marshaled for number three. While he still calls it a trinity, he has in practice expanded it to a quinity of five, to exploit the right-wing passion for guns, and the quest for religious liberty to discriminate against the LGBT, LGBTQ community. Interestingly, he takes right-wing political ideologies prevalent among his congregation and turns them into divine righteous edicts. These, according to Hibbs, is what matters most to their God. Absent from what matters is any divine concern for this planet and its ecological health. Hibbs' simplified civil religion is easy to soundbite and can be rendered into tasty morsels for Fox News broadcast and right-wing rage radio. So Limbaugh and Beck are not alone. My research shows that their new simplified anti-environmental civil religion or gospel has, over the last decade, embedded itself even deeper into the evangelical psyche. Professor Veldman has also shown us how Limbaugh and Beck specialized in valorizing the conservative Christian in-group while demonizing literally everyone outside that group. Why are evangelicals so receptive to such messaging? Elaborating here on my talk to the CSA, I argue that this in-group, out-group ideology has long been embedded in traditional Christian concepts, especially as to ideas of eternal hellfire. The God of evangelical Christianity is a black and white God. No ambiguity, no gray areas, no limbo as with Catholics. Everyone who has ever lived will either live in paradise in a state of perpetual bliss or in hell subject to eternal torture. On the one hand, evangelicals are taught that they are inherently sinful and terrible in every possible way due to their inheritance of original sin from Adam and Eve. Yet, on the other hand, with a simple profession of faith in Jesus, all of that is wiped away and eternal pleasure is your reward. And they get the satisfaction of knowing that their theological enemies will be tortured for eternity. When these, this universe dies, it's heat death 
somewhere between 22 billion and 100 trillion years from now, depending on which astrophysicists you prefer. God is still just getting started, both rewarding and punishing. If you are sure that you and your group are slated by God for eternal reward, might this help embed a collective narcissism for yourself and your group? And even more important for our present moment, could you summon any concern for human-caused climate change? I submit that such concern is a near possibility for these groups. And thus, this new, nominally Christian, anti-environmental civil religion Professor Veldman has shown us may, by effectively blocking climate change mitigation, just have doomed us all. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, I'd like to open the floor for discussion. We have about 15 to 20 minutes for that. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and I'll make my way around. Um, I just ask that you keep your questions brief so we can get around to as many as possible. Hello, okay. Uh, my question for uh, both presenters, is there anybody on the left who is as vocal and as powerful as Rush Limbaugh and his cohorts? Can I take a stab at that? Go for it. Um, I would say the simple answer is no. Uh, there are some powerful voices. Uh, the Reverend Barber in North Carolina is a powerful uh, progressive voice of progressive Christianity. Uh, but I've, I've not heard him engage in any substantial way on environmental issues, climate change, et cetera. And you know, he doesn't have a daily television show. He does not have uh, a radio show. Um, and so even though he gets a reasonable amount of coverage by mainstream media, he does not have the same kind of megaphone. Uh, and I can say that during my uh, PhD research, I was not only just looking at you know, Calvary Chapel evangelicals, I was also looking at um, uh, progressive Christian congregations that affiliate with the Pro uh, Center for Progressive Christianity. And in those congregations, um, uh, there was fairly regular concern about climate change uh, brought up, at least. Uh, it was a fairly common theme in sermons. But this is a little tiny fraction of American Christianity. Uh, and so there's really only a handful of these uh, congregations. And even though they will express concern for climate change and environmental issues, uh, the, uh, their efforts are especially directed at homelessness, the hunger, uh, hunger issues for the poor, uh, attacks on marginalized community, the LBGTQ community. So even, that tends to suck up almost all of their activist energy. And while they will at least pay a bit of lip service to uh, climate change, environmental issues, um, in terms of actual action, it's really quite marginal and small. Bernie? Oh, did you want to just? Uh, I, I have a, a little bit to say about that. Um, the it, certainly the pandemic affected progressive activism, any anything uh, to the left of of center, uh, including environmental issues, climate change action, etc. Because uh, we were all locked up, uh, and just before the pandemic, in the preceding year or so. You know, one of the most dramatic explosions of international environmental activism came in the form of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and that, you know, was a specific, uh, you know, group begun in London, exploded across the entire world, uh, at, you know, addressing the mass extinction that we're currently in. Um, 
And then when's the last time you've heard anything about Extinction Rebellion? I haven't heard anything as soon as the uh, pandemic started. On the other hand, the pandemic did, as, as uh, Professor Veldman was just noting, uh, su- uh, serve to be enormously energizing for everybody to the right of center uh, for these uh, you know, claimed persecutions. And one of the things, you know, I, I highlighted the aspects, the psychological dynamic of collective narcissism, uh, the, the, the so-called war on Christianity. You know, the first element of the famous sermon by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, uh, where, you know, Jesus declares that, you know, if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. And so, even if you're not being persecuted, and there is not any credible basis for thinking that anybody in the United States Christian community is being persecuted for anything. Nevertheless, you need to generate a narrative uh, in uh, being able to persuade yourself that you are persecuted, because we know that if you're being persecuted, that shows you're a follower of Jesus in good standing. Uh, And so, that's how I explain, you know, the whole war on Christians and Christmas and, you know, all these false claims of religious persecution. So they all work to energize the right. And unfortunately, this is just kind of embedded into the structure of our society at the moment. I certainly don't have any easy answers to how, you know, we could turn that around. But, you know, I, as uh, Professor Veldman said, I, I think knowing what we're dealing with is important. Uh, I probably would stop talking if I didn't think there was at least some value in having an accurate perception of the playing field that we're operating on. Wonderful. Um, I know there are still some lingering questions left. I'm sorry, we don't have time to get around to everyone this evening. Um, I would like you to join in thanking me, please, uh, in thanking, please, um, Dr. Braun Taylor, who helped to organize this event and the Department of Religion. So he's on Zoom, if we can give a round of applause. Thank you. And also thanking Brady McCartney, who has done a lot of work behind the scenes to help organize this event. And then if you could please uh, join me in thanking one more time, Dr. Veldman and Dr. Zleha, Uh, for joining us this evening and for their great presentations and responses. Bernie? Yeah? Uh, I said thank you, Bernie. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you.